now. So, hello everyone tuning in. Um, welcome to the second season, I guess you'd call it, of the International Perspectives on Corpora for Language Learning Seminar Series, which is an initiative, a uh, collaborative initiative between the University of Queensland in Australia and the University, the State University of Sao Paulo, uh, UNESP in Brazil, together with our European partners and speakers. And we have uh, our first speaker tonight, who is uh, working at the University of Huddersfield, but is originally from the Ukraine. So obviously, we, uh, our speaker is uh, having a terrible time given everything that's going on uh, in the Ukraine at the moment. And we're incredibly grateful that she has decided to continue uh, to give this talk to you tonight, uh, which I'm sure will be of great interest to everybody here. Uh, Dr. Dr. Tatiana Karpenko-Sikum is Senior Lecturer in EAP at the University of Huddersfield, teaching academic writing to international doctorate students extensively using corpora and concordances in her teaching. She's recently published a resource book called Academic Writing with Corpora, which she was grateful to send to me by post. I received it and I have to say it is one of the most practical, uh, simple, easy to get into guides for students and teachers on using corpora for EAP that I have seen uh, in my career so far. Um, so I'm going to hand you over to Dr. Uh, Karpenko Sikom in a moment. Uh, before I do that, as is customary with um, all kind of public speaking engagements in, um, in Australia, I do just want to acknowledge uh, the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet. Um, we pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country while recognizing their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. So, any more, I'm going to hand you over to Tachan, um, who's going to share her screen. Thanks so much for, uh, for taking the time to talk to us tonight, and uh, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you very much for having me. I'm going to share my screen now. Um, here it is. Right. So yes, um, as Peter said, unfortunately, I'm I'm not on on the top sort of presenting form, but I will do my best. It is just because I'm shaken by by what's going on in in Ukraine by the war, and I'm worried sick about my friends, but I will sort of do my best not, not for, for it not to affect our today's meeting. I'm going to talk today about practical use of corpora and concordance uh, um, in teaching rhetorical functions. And um, as Peter said, that the, the book that, that, that I wrote, it's all about practical and practicalities of it and just helping uh, people to get into it and start using it in their classrooms, maybe relieving them of the burden of, of creating these uh, tasks and exercises. And this talk is basically on the same lines. And uh, Peter has already, uh, introduced me. I'm from Huddersfield uh, in West Yorkshire in England and I uh, teach English for academic purposes to doctorate students at the University of Huddersfield and I think that it is and um, it will be useful to say um, uh, who are my students whom I teach because uh, that will uh, actually have a reflection on the tasks that I'm going to discuss. I teach <clears throat> mixed discipline groups, mostly international students, and my courses and workshops are short. They are sort of two to four sessions only. So I don't have the benefit of having a student uh, or student group uh, throughout a term or a year. Uh, uh, so I can't really sort of introduce um, data-driven learning in uh, the uh, way I, I really would like to ideally. But uh, what I started doing in the courses, and these are just examples of, of some courses and workshops that I run, uh, almost all of them will have uh, corpus results. And that's uh, what I do. I use corpus results in order to support what I'm saying, support what I'm telling about uh, particular 
features of academic writing. And that is um, very useful uh, for students. And it uh, also has a bit of an ulterior motive. So if I do it consistently, uh, then if, I, if they have been to several uh, courses then, and courses are not compulsory or credit bearing, so they choose to come whenever they, they need. So uh, if I so, uh, uh, use the uh, results of corpus consultations, um, you know, uh, frequent enough, then corpus is not such a scary word and uh, a concordance is also a, a familiar thing. So uh, that helps me then to uh, invite students to attend uh, the uh, two specific uh, hands-on um, courses of uh, using corpora, uh, improve your academic English with corpora and concordances for beginners and advanced. Uh, these are again, only four sessions, six hours, but um, that's, it is what it is. So I'm trying to uh, squeeze whatever I can within uh, these parameters. And, and that's why I sort of, I thought I, I will explain to you uh, how I'm doing it. Uh, why am I doing it? I'm doing it because um, I totally sort of uh, a follower of, of Tim Jones in uh, feeling that uh, it is important to stimulate uh, students in inquiry and fostering their ability to notice and interpret patterns of, of usage which they can reproduce in their own writing. And uh, talking about uh, uh, application of data-driven learning to uh, 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 rhetorical patterns, uh, I'm going back to Alex Bolton's paper uh, uh, where he, he is asking, uh, he's saying that one of the criticisms leveled at uh, DDL is that it ignores big themes of language. And the same uh, concern was expressed by, by Sue Hanston and also Adele was saying that there is a challenge in teaching of connecting the surface forms, which are pretty obvious in uh, looking at concordance searches with discursive meaning in teaching. And that's what I'm trying to do. And um, uh, I'm not alone, obviously, here. Uh, there is a, a host of research on rhetorical functions. Uh, and um, it, it's not uh, an exclusive list that there are more. I, I just uh, thought that I, I'll mention at least some of them. Um, and uh, this is in this sort of tradition that I am working, but I'm working from the practical point of view. And uh, going back to Alex Bolton's paper, uh, in reply to his question, is DDL appropriate for big themes in language learning? His answer was, uh, as an additional, it's not a panacea. It can be used as an additional learning technique uh, in some context for particular groups of learners. And I sort of totally agree with it. I, I share uh, this view and that's how I'm going to uh, talk about it. And another thing that underpins sort of my um, interest and my today's presentation is that uh, the, the uh, this description of barriers, which people were talking for quite a long time uh, about the barriers in using corpus consultations, is that many uh, DDL activities require considerable preparation time and uh, there are not enough available uh, ready-made teaching materials. And that's where my book is coming from because I, I wanted actually to share what I have already sort of developed for other people just to uh, take some ready-made um, exercises and tasks and try and use them in their classrooms. And today's presentation is on the same lines. So um, I will be looking today at three corpus tools. Uh, Lex Tutor, Corpus Concordancer, uh, British National Corpus, and MyCASP. Uh, and they are all uh, free, open, easily accessible, and um, user-friendly. I mean, some might disagree with me, but uh, I think my students cope with them. And uh, that is why this is the grounds for me to say that they are user-friendly. Um, could I ask you to help me understand uh, whether you're familiar with these tools or not. If you could go to menti.com and use the code. This is the only Menti um, uh, sort of uh, um, uh, task that I'm going to use in this presentation, but that will help me not to, to waste time uh, saying something that you already know. So if you could yeah, do I, that. I and oh, I'm sorry, I see that voting is closed on your Menti slide. Oh. 
uh, oh. to be able to go in and just open the voting again um, with if oh. you're empty, but otherwise well, we're not going to be able to vote. I don't know why it happened. Oh gosh, yes, I've noticed just it, now. It does this um, sometimes. I, I think. To me before. Yeah, I think I I, I might just just drop it now yeah, well um, the, the because thing. but yeah i, uh, I wouldn't uh, want to, to waste time open. so okay so, well people are saying it's open maybe uh ah it's open yeah yeah it's open no open problems for some or closed for some. Okay. okay it won't let you submit you see oh yeah just just move along then Tatiana. okay yeah i will just um yeah uh yeah. not not waste time any more time on that also, can you maximize your screen? Uh, everything's a bit squashed in the middle at the moment. Are you able okay. to do that? Okay. Um, Don't worry if not. Uh, uh, um. No, it's okay then. Just carry on. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Okay. So sorry about that. Um, I I thought it worked. It worked before for me, but. Um, Anyway, there's always first time. So today I'm going to look at three rhetorical patterns. I actually uh, prepared many more, but um, realistically, I, I could talk only about three uh, rhetorical patterns today. One would be creating a, a, a research space, then problem solution pattern and a counter argumentation pattern. And obviously, uh, the first one is the CAS one uh, suggested by Swales and Feek. And uh, I would uh, like to look at each move and the transition between moves uh, uh, and then look at how concordances, searches can help and support explanation of uh, a particular move. So if we look at, uh, at move one, um, establishing the research uh, territory, there are two ways, according to Swales and Feek, by showing the, the research area or introducing the importance of the research area and uh, by introducing the um, previous research. So if we look at uh, introducing the the importance of the field. Of course, the first port of call would be the adjective important, particularly because uh, Highland and Jung um, uh, in their research said that it is the most common uh, term across uh, several disciplines. And uh, these are both um, uh, humanities and sciences. So uh, this is, let's look at um, uh, importance and important in um, concordances. And uh, this is Lex Tutor Concordance. If you haven't used it before, um, it might look a bit busy, uh, but it isn't. Uh, I usually tell my students uh, um, that you only know in the first uh, instance to do four things here to choose the word form, which is equals, and it is a default setting, then you need to enter a word, uh, let's say important, look on the right or left-hand side uh, of the keyword, and then choose a corpus. This is a definite advantage for me to um, using LexTutor. That's why I uh, like LexTutor very much. And LexTutor is only a small part of a, a platform which is called Complete Lexical Tutor, developed by Tom Cobb of the University of Montreal, and there are all kinds of resources and uh, concordance is only a small uh, part of it. Uh, so there is a variety of academic corpora, and this is very valuable, I think, uh, because there is a, a academic abstracts. It's quite small, but for quick searches, it's, it's just right, really. There's academic general of six million. There is, of course, uh, Bohr, which is uh, an amazing resource of 8 million words, uh, um, British academic written uh, English corpus. And uh, there are several subcorpora of British national corpus by subject area. They don't cover all subject areas, but still it's, it's, it's very important. There's commerce and there's humanities, law, medical corpus. So um, it gives a variety uh, and particularly for people like me who teach sort of mixed groups of uh, students from, from different disciplines. Um, so, and then get concordance. Other functions I introduce sort of little by little as we uh, go on. So uh, as I say, to start with, they only need to know four principal things. Um, looking on the right hand side, um, I draw students attention to the uh, really strong corpus of important because. And my question is why? 
uh, why there is uh, uh, such a close collocation and such a strong collocation of these words and um, let students sort of think about it, uh, particularly uh, because Bohr uh, corpus shows the um, a variety of disciplines where it's coming from. So, so this is a pattern across several disciplines. And this demonstrates to the students uh, the necessity of supporting their claims, particularly value claims. And uh, as you all know, uh, as, as, as teachers, um, students can be quite uh, broad in their statements, particularly at the beginning when they uh, write this, this introductory bit, uh, broad uh, and sort of uh, broad brush kind of statements, wide uh, and generic. Um, so this demonstrates to them that, that they need to explain why they think so rather than just uh, state that another sort of antidote from uh, broad statements is the um, uh, pattern important as. So um, as you can see here, uh, important as pattern specifies uh, the um, statement of importance, makes it more concrete, which is a good thing in academic writing, as we all know, important as means of deferring predators, uh, importing as safeguard, importing as a route for advancement, and so on. So that makes it much more to the point uh, to um, the topic the students are writing. And uh, the similar uh, function, if we sort of uh, scroll up a little bit, there is uh, another pattern, important and and this is the, the, the same function of uh, sort of uh, making their statements of importance more specific, important and all embracing, important and active, important and accurate, and, and so on. Um, very simple searches, but they are sort of tapping into a, a, a very um, important point. Uh, so talking about um, overstatements uh, and how to avoid them, uh, another search is the most important. And it is again uh, coming from, from uh, these papers that you uh, must have read a lot of where, where students stating, well, this is the most important, this is the most uh, um, valuable and, and so on. Again, to demonstrate uh, to students how uh, academic authors try to avoid overstatement is very important, particularly uh, in whatever form it is, uh, be it um, as a demonstration, as I do sometimes uh, in the courses of academic writing style, or as um, a, a sort of hands-on um, task in, in a class of uh, improve your academic writing with concordances. So um, if we look at the search in Lex Tutor, uh, there is a very, very useful box here uh, in yellow, which contains, so you don't need to scroll uh, if, you, if you're only after the, um, collocates and their frequencies. It shows the frequencies of collocates. So uh, you can see here that uh, the most uh, frequent uh, collocate is perhaps after function words, of course, uh, perhaps, and now there's possibly, and there's arguably, um, and there's usually, and they're considered. So uh, this brings, to, uh, brings home to students the idea of um, hedging uh, their um, uh, sort of statements of importance, uh, particularly the ultimate statements of importance. Um, very similar search, again, very simple, um, scrolling, uh, scrolling a little bit down um, uh, to see as the most important and uh, be the most important. So um, the, there's, a, uh, as you can see, I've, I've uh, underlined all the hedging uh, expressions, which are actually, um, so almost uh, sort of eighty percent uh, of the uses of the most important uh, are hedged here in in this selection, and it is known as described as regarded to be held to be said to be. So authors of um, uh, remove responsibility for the absolute statements from them, and and there are two cases when they ultimately do that by saying uh, David Renton argues or uh, another author describes as. So that's not me. So this is again uh, uh, an important sort of lesson in framing uh, there. Um, statements of importance. Uh, British National Corpus is again uh, uh, incredibly uh, rich 
uh, resource. And uh, unfortunately, I today uh, I won't be able to sort of explain it all. You might you might be familiar with it as well, uh, but uh, I will be using today only um, a collocate function and a quick, which is keyword in context, similar to the one that we've seen in Lex Tutor. Also incredibly important is search by parts of speech, which allows us to uh, um, look for, um, for example, a research as a, as a noun, as opposed to research as a verb, which Lex, uh, Lex Tutor doesn't, doesn't do. Uh, and also choose the collocates, the, the parts of speech of a collocate. Uh, British National Corpus uh, was developed by Oxford University Press, um, but now it resides on Mark Davis's platform, uh, English Corpora. And uh, it uh, has 100 million uh, words corpus with academic corpus of uh, 15 million without uh, sort of differentiation in uh, subject area, but we can see uh, what subject uh, or what source uh, the example is coming from. So uh, again, similar search. I just wanted to uh, uh, show the comparison. Uh, there is, uh, if we use the collocates function and the most important and look on the left hand side, uh, again, we can see a very strong pattern of um, uh, of, of hedges there. Uh, so sort of seven out of 10 examples or eight out of 10 examples are hedges, the, um, uh, the uh, immediate collocates, uh, first, second, and third on the left. So that is uh, talking about establishing uh, the research territory uh, by showing the importance so that we, we can uh, sort of involve corpus in supporting some points that are important to make. If we're looking at the second uh, part and uh, establishing the research territory by uh, introducing items of previous research in the area, uh, we again uh, can look uh, in the um, uh, British National Corpus and look at this argument and see how authors sort of deal with this argument. Uh, the argument, the previous argument that uh, other authors um, made. So um, there's uh, the verbs that go with this argument as a subject or with this argument as an object. And if we look at these verbs and uh, we try to draw uh, the attention of students to the fact that they are all, um, they're not just naming what is the argument. It is the sort of critical attitude that shines through this selection of verbs to accept to develop, to confirm, to counter, to be convinced by. That's what we, we tell students. Well, are you convinced by this argument? And if they see the consistent um, sort of uh, pattern of authors uh, questioning uh, the argument, then it, it is very useful uh, for them to take on board these formulae which help them to apply it. Uh, this argument has been extended or questioned or received by the currency, has been explored and so on. Uh, apart from uh, just, just verbs and, and verb phrases, it is important uh, for students to be aware of the linguistic formulae that uh, go with particular rhetorical functions. And in this respect, we can look a little bit further. This is the same search. Um, uh, it is uh, this argument in British National Corpus. Uh, but we can look a little bit further and uh, sort of encourage students to see the phrases. And this is the, again, a, almost a random choice of phrases, which are uh, also guiding students towards critical examination of previous research uh, and previous arguments. So uh, this argument in Lex Tutor, again, uh, the phrases are, are there and it is just um, encouraging students to look a little bit further on both sides, further than one word. A very useful search is uh, apostrophe s argument and apostrophe s claim, which um, helps uh, again to see how uh, previous research is presented and and again uh, uh, the uh, critical way of looking at previous uh, research is. So lacks detailed analysis, fails, gains credibility, makes convincing claims. Again, this idea of being convinced by the claim is, is very important, poses a problem and so on. So um, this 
also on the basis of, of this and on the uh, lines that I can find there, I sometimes set uh, students a task uh, looking at several um, examples and asking what is the point uh, of um, quoting this particular author, what the um, writer is doing by quoting previous research. And again, if uh, there are several sort of examples, they can uh, find really easily identify that uh, it is used to support one's claim or to accept the author's argument or maybe to refute the author's argument or to evaluate the argument as not without merit or, or being weaker and, and so on. So um, again, it's uh, sort of aimed at uh, demonstrating to the students that uh, mentioning previous research has to have some kind of point uh, within uh, the uh, framework of developing their argument. Um, so going to move to establishing a niche uh, by introducing the gap. So uh, first of all, I will um, address this move and then we'll look at the transition because transitions are, are very important. As you know, students writing can be disjointed, times can be uh, quite fragmented. So uh, in this respect, uh, when we uh, talk about establishing um, a niche or a gap, uh, it is the same uh, sort of search that, that uh, could do the job. Little research in academic, um, quick search. And uh, that's what we get, a, a really rich information uh, that students can get, whatever we want to draw their attention to. Is it uh, uh, tense forms? Is it aspect? Is it the, um, uh, the verbs that, pre uh, that uh, are prevalent uh, with little research, so sort of carried, conducted, done, uh, or looking on the left-hand side, there are hedging devices like uh, relatively little research or boosters, remarkably or surprisingly, and sort of similar information we can get in um, talking about a research gap um, with sort of uh, looking at little attention, or a few studies. So uh, the, this, this is a, a very straightforward search, but it gives a lot of information uh, to, uh, for students to think about, apart from just, just uh, sort of verbal information, uh, what verbs are there. Uh, by looking at establishing a uh, research territory and the transition from one to the other, um, I sometimes uh, show uh, these moves together and uh, students can see how they closely connected. And of course, the, the connection here, the most obvious connection is however, because as uh, Barbara at all put it, it leads to the main point that academic author um, is making. And uh, again, a very simple search. Oh my God, what's that? <laughs> That's not me. It somehow um, appeared here this this red line. I apologize for that. So uh, what I uh, usually important. want to uh, to do it's the search on little research and uh, Lex Tutor Concordance has another uh, important function, a useful function to use it with um, associated word. However, so we can uh, look at uh, at this connection, uh, little research with however. Uh, it's not a huge pattern because uh, there are uh, sort of three words involved, a phrase uh, and associated word, but uh, that's not what I'm after at this point. I want to look inside uh, the text. Uh, by pressing at little research, uh, I can get the, um, uh, the, the larger context. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know how this um, thing appeared on the screen. Can you see the, the, the red um, yes, we can see it. line? Um, um, it's definitely not, not me. I don't know how, how it, it, it appeared. Yeah. Um, right, so we'll carry on so yeah. regardless, I suppose. Carry on, that's okay. Um, yeah. So if we look at the um, moves and transitions between moves, uh, because as I say, we, we all know uh, that sometimes students' writing can be really fragmented and uh, uh, there's no internal connection between the, 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 the moves. So uh, this illustrates really well for them how the establishing research territory sort of spills into and, and sort of prepares the ground for establishing the research gap. And in the same way, um, previous research 
when it is mentioned here, uh, goes into, uh, again, establishing the research gap. So uh, these examples show uh, the uh, sequence of these um, moves and how uh, they are uh, sort of intimately connected, these moves. So that is uh, very important here. Looking at uh, the transition between move two and three, establishing the niche and occupying the niche. So uh, again, uh, we need to uh, look at uh, the presenting their own research, how authors go from establishing a niche to occupying it and presenting their own research. Uh, so we will look at this transition and the search is very similar. It is little research can be demonstrated by um, uh, in correlation with however, oh, thank God, this red line, annoying red line disappeared. Uh, so little research and uh, however, in uh, collocating with however, and I look in a wide screen, wide uh, sort of window of nine words uh, in order to see how however appears around uh, the statement of uh, little research. Uh, so uh, this is an example, uh, again, by uh, pressing on the, by clicking on the source, we can get uh, an example and uh, look inside. We can see here an example. There has, however, been a little research on the use of computers in planning practice. Uh, the research aims so this is introducing going in straight with, with our own research and also previous research is mentioned. So uh, in this uh, little paragraph, uh, there are three moves present um, uh, in, in one go. Talking again uh, about the connection between uh, the moves, it is very important, uh, again, to avoid this fragmented kind of writing. Um, it is very important to uh, show that the inner connection between these moves, the verbal connection, uh, and that's what uh, Swales calls lexical sharing, but also semantic sharing. So lexical sharing here can be demonstrated. Again, it is from uh, Lex Tutor, from expanded uh, context uh, in Lex Tutor, the, the example. So uh, we can see there's little research and then the purpose of this research. Uh, the transition supported lexically by uh, the field of machine translation and MT techniques. That's uh, sort of lexical gelling these uh, points together. And uh, here, little research in information system security, again, uh, information system security study. Uh, uh, there's also semantic sharing uh, where um, here, little research, and we choose to investigate introducing uh, one's own research. What we do, we um, then uh, uh, connect them semantically from outside London, a provincial city. So it's a questionable connection, but still there is a semantic uh, sharing between them. Uh, and another example of semantic sharing, religion in the lives of children and young people. And then here, children and young people from Christian, Muslim, Jewish, and Sikh backgrounds. So uh, you can see how uh, th these uh, um, moves are sort of kept together and they uh, not only follow each other in a disjoint manner, but I kept, they are um, kept together. Now, the uh, going uh, uh, still on the topic of move three and presenting one's own research um, for, for the, the uh, teacher like myself who teach uh, groups of uh, people from different uh, uh, sort of, uh, subject backgrounds. Um, it is very useful for me to highlight the differences between different subject areas. And to do that, um, I would like to say a few words about my CASP, uh, Michigan Corpus of Upper Level Student Papers. Again, invaluable resource, a resource, really, really useful. Uh, it, it's not huge, it's about 2.6 million words, but uh, there are 16 disciplines presented. There are papers uh, in uh, 16 disciplines and the search, you can search uh, not just by student level, by nativeness, uh, you can search by paper types, like argumentative essays just, or just proposals and also by textual features, by abstract, 
methodology section, literature review, which is incredibly useful. It, um, it, is, uh, it, it presents for us uh, the range of samples of genre specific elements, which is important because when we are looking at rhetorical devices, maybe sort of formulae are important, but also it is important to see uh, the whole thing, how it works in a text. And that's what uh, my CASP does because it doesn't present the results in a um, quick kind of format. Uh, keyword in context format. It presents the results uh, um, in the first instance uh, in larger context of paragraphs. Uh, however, if we click on the uh, paper ID, we can see the whole paper. We can see that the students can uh, see how this pattern works in a larger context. So uh, this, for example, paper that I've um, clicked on, it, it has got specific features which are highlighted here. So we can look at definitions specifically at problem solution pattern and a reference to the sources. Uh, so on the uh, same topic of uh, still the um, third move uh, presenting one's own research. Um, as we all know, research can be presented in, in many ways. Uh, uh, we can present it as a development of an argument, as testing a hypothesis, or as uh, identifying problem and offering a solution to this problem. So for um, a teacher like myself who teach students coming from different um, subject areas, it is useful to know which is preferable in which particular subject area. So if we look at argument here, and this is the screenshot of uh, the search for argument, um, you can see that it is preferred uh, definitely in philosophy, uh, in political sciences and uh, economics, uh, followed by linguistics, history, sociology, and English, with a minimal amount of, of the use of argument in mechanical engineering in all kinds of, in three types of uh, engineering papers. Interestingly, if we look at hypothesis, the dynamics is totally different. Um, the uh, biological research and linguistic research uh, followed by psychology uh, really frames their research very often as hypothesis and uh, testing uh, this hypothesis. And the um, last point is that if we look at problem, then problem definitely has a prevalence in the papers, in engineering papers, uh, but also in economics and philosophy as well, uh, with a general sort of uh, generally higher number uh, of uh, problem being used in other papers too. So this is very um, useful information for students uh, when they are setting out to, to write their papers or uh, to write their, their reports to, to, to understand what is uh, the convention of their area of research. So um, I think I've got a little bit of time and I can cover as well uh, the problem solution rhetorical pattern, which is uh, sort of coming from, from the previous um, screen. Uh, so if we, if we look at problem uh, here, and if we look uh, only, choose only problem solution patterns, then uh, again, we can see that problem solution pattern uh, is prevalent in the papers on engineering and also in what kind of papers. We can look on the right-hand side and this pie chart shows that, again, it is prevalent in research papers. Again, very useful information, very, very easy to access and to interpret um, uh, useful guidance for students. So looking at problem solution pattern again, uh, again, Swales and Feek, um, the, 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 the classical work. So there's a description of a situation, identification of a problem, description of solution, and evaluation of solution. All of these can be helped uh, by doing corpus searches. And again, however, comes into its own because it is, um, as has been uh, noted before, it is a common way of introducing the problem. And Maggie Charles also sort of devoted an article on the role of however um, in signaling the problem. So if we um, look at a very simple search, again, problem with associated word, however, um, we, we can see a really, really strong pattern. And again, so questioning, uh, asking students, why do you think it is uh, so important, however, and problem, and making them think 
how this pattern um, is associated with uh, a, a rhetorical uh, introduction of a, of a problem, rhetorical uh, sort of a framing of a problem. And again, uh, along the same lines, they can find uh, the uh, expressions that, that can, use, can be used, the formulae that, that can be used here. Uh, so it is, a, again, a combination of uh, um, a, a corpus approach and discourse approach here uh, meets uh, each other. Uh, British National Corpus, again, very similar search. Uh, Collocates problem uh, with, however, uh, wide window. And again, we can have uh, plenty of examples. And if we go into these examples, we can find uh, the uh, more specific and sample uh, fuller, uh, larger context uh, to discuss. So if we look at this example, there is a, uh, there has been much investigation in mathematics situation. Um, and then it goes into identification of a problem, um, how to solve the problem efficiently and optimally. And then uh, solution, my uh, original method for solving this problem. And then evaluation is right there. Uh, quick and intuitive and intuitively simple and original. So uh, also it, it can show students that uh, these patterns uh, can um, exist in small amount of uh, words, only two sentences, but four um, problem solution uh, moves there. Um, if we look at the second one uh, very briefly, it is identification of a problem. Again, we can um, look at because uh, and the role of because uh, in identification of a problem is very important because it connects writers claim to supporting facts. And we are again uh, carrying on this topic, uh, which we started with important carry on the topic of, of supporting what they're saying and the importance of it and how we can demonstrate it, demonstrated by a really um, a strong pattern of problem associated with because. And uh, we can, uh, this also uh, sort of supports uh, Lynn Flowerdew's research, uh, who uh, researched the problem solution pattern in professional writing and students writing. And she came to the conclusion that 95% of tokens for problem uh, in professional writing were in some kind of causal context, whereas in students writing, it's only 32%. So that is why it is so important to demonstrate, to show uh, them uh, that the problem does um, uh, associates with the causes. And uh, these are sort of examples of, of this problem solution pattern again. So the problem arises because that is ident identification of the problem um, and with reasons and then description of the problem, uh, description of the solution, sorry, and uh, evaluation of the solution here, um, which is uh, sort of uh, gives some kind of um, negative uh, take on this solution, but uh, this causes a corresponding increase in the size of database. So this is this is a, a evaluation with uh, some kind of um, uh, criticism of it. Uh, and um, maybe the last uh, point that I wanted to make today is evaluation of the solution. Very important and again very straightforward. We look for solution. We look on the left hand side and look at the adjectives uh, which authors use to evaluate the solution. And there's a uh, enormous amount of them. And uh, I ask students uh, at this point to look through them, pick them out. And also we talk about uh, classifying them into strong and cautious, for example. And that's strong um, solution. And this is uh, cautious um, uh, sort of adjectives that um, uh, qualify solution as sort of walk uh, workable, possible, tentative suitable, whereas strong are, are successful, effective, optimal, and perfect. Uh, and I got interested in this perfect because I found it also in one of my students' drafts. And I looked through uh, all the corpora, academic corpora in Lex Tutor, and there are only um, six instances between three uh, corpora there. Uh, and if we look 
with students into the instances of this solution. We can see that it is never found a perfect solution, no perfect solution, not a perfect solution, none has a perfect solution. So uh, overwhelmingly uh, sort of denying the fact that there could be a perfect solution and two other ones are really uh, two hedged ones, uh, heavily hedged because there are two hedges there seemed like the perfect solution. Uh, and the similar dynamics is in uh, British National Corpus. Uh, never found a perfect solution, none. Uh, of course, there's no perfect solution and less than perfect solution. So um, this demonstrates again to the students the uh, importance of uh, um, strength of claim when they are uh, choosing uh, the um, adjectives to evaluate the solution. And again, uh, avoiding uh, the overwhelming over generalization, like the best solution, which sometimes happens as, as, as you will all know in students' writing. So uh, if we look at the best solution and look on the left-hand side, you can see that there is, appears to be, uh, seems to be, is not always, may not be, seems. So the best solution uh, is not used just to, to qualify uh, or to, um, um, modify a solution and uh, to call it the, the best. Authors are very careful with that. And there are two sort of uh, uh, solutions found and they are sort of aspirational uses in order that the best solution is found. And here again, in order to find the best solution. So uh, basically hedging is prevalent uh, in using and uh, uh, discussing solution and the um, degree of hedging is also uh, quite important. Well, I uh, I think I uh, I don't know, Peter. What would you um, advise me to do? I can uh, very quickly cover the counter argumentation, um, but also I I can stop here and uh, answer questions. What, what what would you prefer me to do? I think at this point, because uh, we've got quite a few questions that have come through, um, we. Um, might stop here then and, okay. and we'll get some of those questions in as we're coming up to 10 to 10. Okay, yeah, that's what I thought. And um, yeah, the, the, the last thing that I just wanted to say is, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Uh, um, and then the, that similar uh, suggestions can be found uh, tasks in my book. There are references as well. And these are corpora. Uh, and corpus tools that I used. Yes, that that that's that's fine. Okay, so if there are questions, I'll be um, happy to have a go at answering them. Thank you so much, Tatiana. And I have to say, um, again, such a, a very practical talk. Lots of fantastic tips, advice for the audience. And this is the biggest audience that we have got by a long way we've got 230 people sat in this room at the moment which is a record for me hopefully it's a record for you too oh, yes. got the interest in what you're doing and the comments i hope through, i didn't disappoint absolutely not the comments coming through in the chat are absolutely so supportive of everything that you've presented here today so I'm going to get into the questions. Uh, I usually, uh, I might, I'll leave the recording on for the questions this time, as Peter, because we're not going to have people um, tune in and ask questions by, by their mic. So um, we're going to, I think we've got time for maybe five questions. So I'll just select from the ones that I've got. First question is from Paula. She would like to know if your students keep on using the tools as they become more experienced, have you managed to keep track of them yet or not? Um, yeah, as I um, said, I, I would love to do that. Um, as I said, it is very difficult because I've got small groups and I've got uh, them. I, I run the course of hands on uh, corpora about four times a year. And, and the, the groups, the maximum group uh, size is 12. That is 12 seats in my classroom. Um, Every now and again, I um, ask um, our admin to uh, email all the students who have been on the on, on the course uh, over a year to ask whether they they carry on using it. Or sometimes, if I see the student and I, I 
in a, for example, in a tutorial and I see that they're making a particular mistake, I'm saying, look, it can be really easily remedied with, with Corpus Search. Are you still using it? So I, I get um, uh, a really anecdotal um, anecdotal uh, evidence that, uh, that students, sort of maybe half of them, uh, they are uh, still, but as I say, I haven't got uh, data for that because it is uh, very, I've got small groups, I've got uh, students who are uh, coming and going and sometimes they they enroll uh, to the course again to, to uh, have uh, another go at, uh, at using it and uh, um, so what I would say from, from, from what I feel uh, and from these um, uh, questionnaires that I, I used to send out to them before, about 50%, uh, definitely 50% carry on uh, using them. Some become a, a real enthusiast, some, some just drop it um, altogether. Okay, thank you. Um, got a question then from Lawrence Anthony who has tuned in with us tonight. Uh, he said, the free tools that you introduced do not allow the input of the user's target texts, because obviously you're constrained by the text that yeah. those platforms provide. So what are the implications of that if the corporate in the tools don't match the needs of the learners that you're working with? Uh, that That is very true. So in the course uh, that I'm, I'm running, uh, um, I, ha I haven't mentioned it, but it improve your academic writing with corporate. There are four sessions uh, and in advanced part of the course, the last session is building their own corpus. But that is uh, for students who've been through um, beginners who decided that they want to go a bit further and to build their own corpus. So I, um, uh, I help them to build. They end uh, this course with having their own DIY corpus. Uh, but if, if they want to just stick with uh, Lex Tutor, it, it will help, but obviously not to such an extent as uh, using uh, their own corpus with Ant Kong, for example. Um, yeah, I um, I agree that uh, uh, th this is the danger. But uh, as I say, I'm, I'm trying to introduce them to um, creating their own corpora. Thank you very much. I hope that answers Lawrence's question. Um, the next question then is from Mai. Uh, she actually has two. Um, maybe I can ask them at the same time. First of all, how do you decide on which textual items to search for in the corpus to represent each move? Secondly, the MICOSP uh, platform is, could be considered a learner corpus unlike the other two. How might that affect the results of searching with that particular corpus? Um, yeah, that, that, that is also true, but uh, 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 BO, the, the corpus, BO is also the, the learner corpus, and uh, um, I think that there is a lot of research into uh, the value of learner corpora, and because they are at the appropriate level for PhD students, I think uh, this uh, these are very valuable uh, resources, and, and uh, they... Uh, they learn from them uh, quite a lot uh, as they would from, uh, for example, academic general in um, uh, Lex Tutor. So I uh, usually introduce them to, to the variety of them and uh, uh, then they can have a choice. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, question from Eric Chung, who asked, do you, um, prefer to ask the students to operate the tools themselves, or do you prefer to show them the concordances? The reason why he asks is because he says when he uses the tools in his live online classes, students find it sometimes difficult to switch between the screens. Yes, that's it. When you're teaching online, it is difficult, yeah. Uh, but um, I sort of allow more time when I teach online, I allow more time. I demonstrate, uh, as I said, I, I demonstrate some searches in shorter courses, which are not specifically aimed at uh, DDL, at, at uh, using corpora and concordances. Uh, that's um, just, just to demonstrate, yes, uh, because I don't have time to, to go into the searches. When I uh, look at 
um, improve your academic writing with corpora, I allow a little bit more time. I, I cut it down when I started to teach uh, online, cut it down to allow more time for them to search, to, to, to make mistakes. It's more difficult than, than in the classroom because in the classroom you can always come and help. Uh, um, but uh, yeah, I, I always wait till, till, till they uh, do the complete search, uh, ask their questions and, and so on. So they, um, in this course, I definitely prefer them to do it themselves. And I also sort of started uh, having a, an additional class, uh, which is just practice. After I've done the course, uh, there will be um, a class an hour and a half where anyone can, can come and practice, just practice with me. So that helps again for online setup. But then um, when I start uh, teaching fully on campus, I think I will um, stick to that uh, practice uh, session so that they can come and practice or have a practice session after the class. Thank you. I, we've got the final question then from Adam Turner and he asks, if you found it useful to have students from different disciplines uh, in your classes, um, and what has that done um, with the kind of experience of the students doing DDL? Right. Well, I actually would, um, generally speaking, um, it restricts me to, to uh, um, some sort of generic kind of statements and searches. And, and that's why I, I would like to go to my CUSP and show uh, disciplinary differences. Uh, it is not always possible. So that, that is, I don't think it's ideal. I don't think it is ideal for, for this, but I don't have any other choice. That, that's how I um, work, how the, the, uh, my classes are set. Uh, I, uh, uh, I don't have a, a, a possibility to teach uh, separate sort of uh, schools of uh, our university. Um, so I have to uh, deal with it somehow. And, and, and the, yeah, for me, it's not ideal. I don't think it is ideal. I think I, it will be uh, more um, to the point if we looked uh, at the corpora, um, which are more subject specific to the students. However, uh, when they build their own corpora, they, they have an opportunity to uh, look through the, uh, through the corpora that uh, are appropriate subject, uh, subject wise um, to them. Okay, thank you so much, Tatiana. Uh, that's the final question for tonight. And again, um, I'd just like to thank you and on behalf of the audience to uh, for taking the time and coming to talk to us tonight. The comments in the chat have just been so enthusiastic and appreciative for the talk that you've given. Um, the participant yeah. numbers tell another story, um, and especially given everything that you must be going through right now to come through and to give this talk for us tonight is a, is a real honor and a pleasure. So thank you very much. We're gonna let you now uh, get back to uh, trying to contact your, your loved ones in Ukraine. Uh, we wish you all the best. We will send the links out to the recording uh, that you'll be able to access from the website that you use to register. And I just want to briefly introduce uh, Tatania, if you, if you could just shop, stop sharing your screen for okay. one moment, I will just introduce the, um, the next seminar for our audience today, where uh, for next week and the note the the day change, uh, the time is the same, but we're going with a Thursday session next week with uh, Dr. Pascal Perez Paredes uh, from the University of Murcia, uh, and he's going to be presenting on data driven learning in informal context. So uh, we got over 200 participants today. I'd be honored if we could crack 200 participants again next week. But that's all for now. Thanks for tuning in. Look out for the recording. And thank you so much to the audience. Thanks again to Tatiana. And we wish you all the best. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much, Tatiana. Thank you, Peter, for all. That's fine. Yeah. Um, a fantastic session. Glad Great to be indeed. doing this again. 
and um, we've just got some uh, some great speakers, and we just love doing this. This is good stuff. This is, this is the highlight of my of my job doing these doing these seminars. That's why I just love doing them. So do I. Thank you so much.